Good evening, everybody. My name is Rod Escaola, and I'm a condominium lawyer with uh, Gowling WLG. Welcome to Condo Virus episode 10. Uh, tonight's episode is, get ready for that, reopening condo land. Uh, we've spoke already about the registration problem. So for the last 10 weeks or so, we've uh, called upon key industry experts to answer your questions and help uh, the industry navigate to this uh, COVID crisis. And week after week, guess what? They come back, they answer the call of duty and they, they show up and week after week, generously sharing with, uh, with all of us their knowledge, their expertise. And so I'm gonna do as I usually do, I'm gonna go around the table and I will, the, around the virtual table and I'll introduce them to you. Uh, a manager from Crossbridge, speaking on behalf of ACMO, having lived on La Isla Bonita, the Madonna of condo management. Good evening, Catherine Gao. Good evening, everybody. Nice to be here again. I had different titles I could have picked from uh, Catherine, but I was afraid that uh, maybe disclose too much information about you. <laughs> and so now we also have a manager from Apollo Property Management, shooting faster than his shadow, the Sony Bono of condo management in Ottawa, Sean Cornish. Hi, Sean. Hey, Rod. Uh, I don't know why it makes me nervous when you start those things. Thank you. <laughs> Speaking on behalf of CAI Canada, she believes in life after love, the share of Lash Condo Law. Good evening, Denise Lash. Hello, everyone. Great to be here. Thanks for coming again. And now on to our favorite condo twins, a condo lawyer with Gowling WLG, standing on the bridge over trouble waters, the Paul Simon of condo governance, Graham McPherson. Hi, Graham. At least I'm not Garfunkel. <laughs> He's coming, the Garfunkel counterpart, now homeward bound, David Plotkin. Hi, David. Good evening. I was not consulted on these introductions. <laughs> From the National Life Safety Group, observing this space oddity, we have David Bow uh, Bowie this of uh, Safety and Security. Hi, Jason Reed. Thanks for coming back. Good evening. Thanks for having me. And finally, from Keller Engineering, with him, you've always got a friend, the James Taylor of Engineering, Justin Tudor. Thanks for coming. Uh, Let's dive in, folks. So that's who we have with us tonight. Week after week, you send us hundreds of questions. Uh, we love those. Keep them coming. That's how we build the agenda. Uh, we try to sort of build around whatever's troubling you. Uh, and we'll do our best again this week to answer your questions. Uh, the chat room is open. I can see it's already open. I can't wait to read how people reacted to the introductions. You know, I do my best, folks. But I see that we have amongst the uh, chatters in the peanut gallery, we have uh, very um, knowledgeable people that will, uh, as they do every week, share their knowledge and their expertise. I see, uh, I see Michael. I see Bob. Uh, I see lots of managers. I hope Murray's there. I see uh, it's just like romper room and friends now. I'm just like pointing at people I see. Uh, so they'll jump in if you get out of hand and feel free to um, share your questions. Um, make sure that when you share your question on the chat room, you click on panelists and all participants. Otherwise, we're the only ones that get to benefit from your question. As we do every week, I'm going to jump into my disclaimer now. Uh, this is a webinar for you that we put together, but the legislation we refer to is Ontario legislation. So those of you listening from outside of Ontario, you'll have to adapt to your legislation. The information we're providing you tonight is uh, accurate as of the day of this broadcast, which is uh, May 20th, 2020. So the situation changes on a daily basis. If you watch this broadcast later on, uh, just keep that in mind. Also, it's important for you to keep in mind that the information we share with you today is of general it's general in nature and they may not specifically answer your specific problems, your specific situation. It's important for you to uh, seek advice, professional advice, and to seek advice that's tailored to the very specific situation that you're facing. Uh, and finally, I have to tell you that this session is recorded. We'll upload it later on Condo Advisor, condoadvisor.ca. It usually takes us about a week to upload it because we have day jobs. And you can access this by clicking on webinar at the top right uh, corner of the blog. Quick, click, click on webinar and you'll get to see next week's webinar and you'll also get to see past webinars. It's a view on demand. And there we are. Now let's go on to the topics that we're gonna be covering today. So those are the people I've introduced already. These are the topics um, and let's keep going. Now, 
every week we have a bit of a debate whether to, just before we dive in, whether to return next week. Uh, and at one point, I assume you'll all be COVID it out. Um, and so every week we're debating, like, do we do another broadcast next week? Uh, do we space them out to two, uh, every two weeks? Do we um, go once a month? Do we pull the plug? Um, and I mean, we, we, we realize you're all busy and we don't take your time for granted. Uh, we're here for you. And if at one point in time, this doesn't sort of make sense anymore to you, well, you know, that's fine. We can all go back to our day job. So maybe we wanted to have a poll, but maybe with a show of hand, and I'm sorry to do it this way. It's not going to be uh, a secret ballot. I think the poll should work. Oh, okay. So uh, Graham, do you want to work on the poll? And then I'm going uh, to do it. We're going to do it right now. So let's see. Oh, look at that. So the choices, my friends, are uh, keep going on a weekly basis, every second week, uh, once a month. Notice I didn't say never. I didn't, we didn't give you the option to just get rid of us. That's, that's the kind of people we are, in your face. That's what we are. Okay, so the, the polls are coming in. Obviously, those that are absent get, don't get to vote, but we'll just assume that they're covid it out. Okay, so we'll keep the polls coming and eventually we'll, um, we'll see how it goes and we'll share it. I'm going to close the polls in, I think, 10 seconds. Okay, very good. Let's uh, dive in, or you want to share the, the results there, Grim? And... There it is. There it is. I guess uh, we're going to be uh, back here next week. It was, it was a tight race. <laughs> next week, we're probably going to be here. I got to tell you that we have an epic episode coming up. It's not going to be next week, but I have an epic episode coming up, but I've been sworn to secrecy and you don't want to miss that one. Hint, hint to one of the panelists. Um, can you remove the results from the screen, uh, Graham? Uh, yes. Okay. Now, reopening Ontario. We've said it before, uh, and that's the first topic. Um, there it is. Reopening, uh, closing down was the easy part. Reopening is gonna be a lot more difficult. You, we can't just open the floodgates. Uh, we can't just go back to the old ways. Reopening condo land is like parachute jumping. It's a fall. The question is, can you control it, right? And, and there's been lots of movements on that front this week. Uh, emergency orders were extended. Uh, some businesses are reopening, obviously not hairdressers. And, and what, what does it all mean for condo land? Uh, Graham, can you maybe update us on, on, on this, on what are the uh, changes this week? Yeah, certainly. So um, before we dive into this, you're, you're gonna see a lot of slides with a lot of information. And uh, that I think will be of most benefit uh, when should you, should you have the desire, you go onto the Condo Advisor website and download the slideshow. Um, there's a lot of information there that I probably won't go over because a lot did happen. So I'm gonna focus mainly on what is going to affect condos more specifically. So right off the bat, uh, the emergency orders, like the one on social gatherings, the one on essential businesses, the ones closing am amenities outside, that has been extended to May 29th, 2020, at least. Um, and it was previously set to expire yesterday. Uh, there's a link there where you can find all of those orders and when they're extended into. And uh, it's just important to keep in mind that uh, that extension of the orders is different from the emergency period. So the emergency period ends for now on June 2nd. And it's because we're in an emergency period that the government can make the orders that it's making. So one interesting thing is that all facilities that are providing indoor recreational programs other than essential businesses are still closed. So as we'll see, um, this certainly means that you know, pools are still closed, uh, gymnasiums for the most parts are still closed, and, and we're, gonna, we're gonna get into that a, a little more detail in a bit. I think that one we're skipping, eh, uh, Graham? Social gatherings of over, pardon me? Uh, oh, no, don't worry, we're, we're gonna skip that next one, but yeah, but social gatherings of five or uh, of over five are still prohibited. Uh, the next, if you wanna learn about how uh, parking lot church services work, it's right there. Um, so now any businesses that engage in retail or rental of items to the public uh, that have a public entrance on the street or sidewalk are open if they use particular means like what we're seeing at grocery stores. Um, and there's been more specific services that have opened, but uh, on the next slide is where we're gonna get into more 
where we're relevant to this topic. So I'm going to start this off by prefacing at the start that even if an essential business is open, it still must abide by the recommendations of public health officials. We need to keep this in mind when I talk about this is open and now you can go do this. It's always with that caveat that you need to, in so opening a business, respect the recommendations of public health officials and follow those. Um, so two main ones off the bat that really are going to come to the discussion on condos are the expansion of the definition of maintenance and something new we're seeing called domestic services. So for maintenance, as you can see here, the definition that we used to have was maintenance, repair, and property management services that were strictly necessary to manage and maintain safety, security, and sanitation and essential operation of condos. We can see now that those qualifiers have been removed. And this, in our view, um, gives a lot more leeway to condominiums uh, and businesses to that are providing services for maintenance um, to continue with business as usual, quote unquote, respecting uh, the recommendations of public health officials. So no longer do you need to ask for this to be legal. Do we need to do this for the building to function? Do we need to do this for the strict necessity of maintaining security? Um, so th this now is more of a, a discretionary issue. Uh, similarly, domestic services that support the operation of households, and that includes housekeeping, cooking, and indoor and outdoor cleaning and maintenance services are now essential. Now, what I, I see someone saying window cleaning. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and go out on a limb here and say that, that window cleaning is now, under the provincial government guidelines, probably acceptable. Um, so, in terms of domestic services, it's important to remember that even if you know people are allowed to have their house cleaners come back and their and their gardeners and their private cooks, I'm not I'm not sure. But uh, even even if the provincial government says that's okay, that does not necessarily mean your condominium has to allow anyone in at any time in any circumstances, no matter what. Uh, ultimately, as we've said before on this uh, on this podcast on this webinar, uh, the condominium is the uh, controller and occupier of the common elements. So you know. Uh, safeguards like uh, requiring a mask or gloves or PPE may have to be put in place uh, before you can allow these P these uh, services in. Change of slides now. Yep. So something else we're seeing is that a lot of outdoor sport facilities are opening and uh, as you can see here there are some requirements that uh, need to be adhered to in order to open one of these facilities. Um, and similarly, certain indoor facilities like golf driving ranges or shooting ranges are opening. But uh, the, what we're seeing here is that you need to stay two meters apart. Uh, you can't play team sports. You can't play sports that are likely to result in people coming within two meters of each other. And the locker and change rooms have to remain closed, except to the extent that they provide washrooms or first aid. And so I think this is relevant in that while gymnasiums and, and pools and such are not open yet, what we're seeing here is a hint as to what we can probably expect the guidelines to be when these things do open. Now, I, I said before that, that gymnasiums and fitness rooms were, were closed, and that was technically not true. They, they are open, but only to professional sports teams and only if the requirements that are listed here are followed. So again, you know, uh, no team sports and no pool sports. So uh, for those wondering if, if the pools can be opened, they, they still can't. Not even professionals can use those yet. Um, you need to physically distance with two meters apart. Uh, the only people who are permitted to use these facilities are professional athletes. And, uh, and the same uh, requirements that I had said before with respect to the change rooms. And so I think yeah, and I'm going out on a limb here because we haven't seen what the regulations will look like yet, but I think what we can expect um, for when gyms open are that, uh, you know, especially in condos, that maybe the, re the requirement will be that only owners and residents can use it, or that you have to stay two meters apart, or that you have to abide by the condominium's guidelines. And we're going to have to see how that shakes out. But as of now, the status quo still is, as far as the province is concerned, gyms should be closed, pools should be closed. Right, and I think that's just something um, else to take away at, at this stage, at this point. Uh, exactly. Uh, is uh, gyms are still closed, pools are still closed, 
um, the kinds of amenities where you have a gathering of people, they're still actually closed in Ontario. Uh, and we'll go amenity by amenity. Uh, anything else before I switch uh, speakers, uh, Graham? No, I think those were the those were the top hits. And, and like I said, there's a lot of information there because a lot of stuff happened uh, very recently. So uh, check out the, uh, the slideshow uh, if, if you feel like it and you'll be able to see in more detail. Right, and, and that was the point actually. Uh, today we've decided to leave all the slides even though we were sort of just skimming over the important one and you'll be able to review these uh, at your leisure. Uh, okay, very good. And I see there's already all sorts of questions on, on the chat room. What about barbecues? What about this? What about that? Well, fear not. This is why we have brought here Sony Bono and, uh, and Madonna of management. And I know we've done this exercise last week of going over uh, the various amenities to see what you could open and what you shouldn't reopen. Uh, but the reality is that this is an ongoing exercise. You'll probably have to do this on a semi-regular basis. Now, if you want a full analysis of what goes into that decision-making process, have a look at last week's webinar. And in fact, Jason last week provided us with a tremendous set of slides where he went amenity by amenity compared to what other people were doing and then looked at what are the um, concerns to keep in mind if you are gonna reopen. So last week is where you get really the, the brains, the, the, like the, the intellectual sort of analysis. But this week, what we've done is we've launched a survey and many of you have answered the survey. So what we're gonna do in parallel, you're gonna get to see um, what our survey respondents have said about the various amenities. And you'll also get to see what our two um, manager extraordinaires have to say. And we're gonna go through all of these here. And just so you, you get to see what the, the slides will look like, uh, I'll explain them once, but then after that, we'll just show you the slides. Um, for instance, when we've asked people, is it time to open the fitness room? You will see that less than 10% of the respondents said yes. You'll see that 70% of the respondents said no. And you'll see that a bunch said that they didn't have any. And so this pattern you'll see on every one of our slides. Keep in mind that about 60% of our respondents are directors and about 10% are owners. Do you see a pattern here? I think we're able to identify the owners uh, having responded to that survey, right? And I think you'll see that pattern throughout. Okay, very good. Let's turn to managers now. Um, Let's start with uh, maybe window washing uh, and landscaping. I'm gonna start with, uh, with you, Catherine. What, what's your take on window washing and landscaping? Window washing is yes and landscaping is yes. And those are sweeping statements. But the intention behind those is that they are easily physically distanced out from a safety and security measure. And when you're talking about scheduling work in the condominium, whether that's in the common elements or in suites, the first and foremost thought process has to do with safety, both of the residents and of the crew who are working. The caveat, the couch there is uh, one, to make sure that your roof anchor inspection has been completed. And second, that if accessing the windows for cleaning requires entry through a suite, uh, that is not something that currently is being scheduled, but it might be something you discuss with either the homeowner or the board. Uh, what they might choose to do is clean as many windows as possible, um, you know, kind of 80 or 70% being better uh, than nothing. Um, but that's a conversation to have as well. Okay, wonderful. Uh, Sean, anything to add or do I give you the next one? Uh, well, just touching on a similar point raised last week about uh, roof anchors, an integral part of, of window washing. Uh, obviously, easy to, to inspect the common element uh, roof anchors, less so those that are on exclusive use common element. Um, right. So tying into Catherine's comment about only doing certain drops, uh, that would be another reason why you may be doing that if, if the roof anchors cannot be inspected uh, okay. in time for window washing to be done. And stick, sticking with you, uh, Sean, what about the garage washing, pressure washing of garages? Yeah. So garage washing is, uh, is a, a tougher one um, because uh, the impact of not doing it can be significant in terms of uh, damage to your, your membrane or uh, to your drainage, uh, your drain system in late garages. But at the same time, the requirement for owners uh, to move their vehicles, all converging on an elevator around the same time, jumping into their vehicles, and trying to find parking when so many people are still working at home and are parking on the streets. Um, so it's not an easy one. Uh, it's, I would say it's allowed, um, certainly, um, but is it practical or is it a, a good idea? It'll depend very much on the individual building and, and the circumstances 
uh, in terms of multi-level parking. You can do one level at a time, minimizing the crowds. Uh, and if you have easy access to neighboring uh, open parking lots, maybe a commercial building that's been shut down, uh, allowing you to use the lot, uh, that could be helpful as well. Okay, wonderful. Uh, let me now go to uh, the big one, the fitness room. I'll start with you, uh, Catherine, maybe. It's, it's really quite easy in Toronto because we're still under the multi-residential order, which requires all of those types of amenities to be closed. Even if that were not the case, of course, you're not opening any area that is going to have a, a congregation of more than five people. It's going to encourage more more people than that. The other problem is going to be sanitation of that space uh, between users. And so kind of fundamentally, you're going to be thinking of who can sanitize that equipment, whether or not it needs to be validated by a third party, which in last week's episode, we uh, agreed that it needed to be and what other precautions will be required if and when something like the fitness center is opened. They tend to be small spaces. The reality of it is if and when they are permitted to be opened, they're likely to be restricted for use by one person or one family at a time. That's the reality of how much space is in that place. And as Jason, I think, discovered or discussed in, in quite a bit of detail last week, the amount of, of droplets that are expected to be expelled because you're breathing heavily is also expected to require distancing of greater than six feet. Don't make me say it again. Don't make me say it again. Uh, Moistly, <laughs> you're dying to say it, yes. David, uh, there was an article that came out recently uh, about gyms and what's expected to, what, what's the post-COVID expected to look like. Uh, can you give us a very quick uh, rundown on this? Oh, did we look sure, Yeah, and that, that photo you put up is uh, futuristic and scary. Gary, you want to hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. So the, the photo you put up there uh, is pretty uh, futuristic looking and scary, but probably what it's actually going to be like. So there was uh, an article um, interviewing some of the gym owners in Toronto talking about what is it that they are planning for their gyms in the eventuality of opening. And the, the plans include, as you see, plexiglass in between uh, equipment, spacing out equipment uh, far apart from uh, one another, uh, limiting the number of uh, participants in, the, in their uh, local classes, uh, keeping a lot of their classes online, and having very, very constant and regular cleaning regimens. Uh, that's something that, you know, when, when owners are, are pressing you, okay, let's, let's open up these gyms. We can have people, you know, wipe down their own equipment. We could have people sign waivers. This is the type of thing that you've got to think of the difference between a, a, a condos gym and the, the fitness facilities that are run by private enterprise, but they're able to have constant resources for cleaning and uh, for keeping people distanced from each other. So that, that's one of the big differences, uh, when, you know, when you're, when you're getting pushback from owners about uh, your, your facilities within your condos. Right. And we'll put a link to this article. And we're not suggesting that this article necessarily reflect what's going to take place in condominiums. This is truly in, in the commercial setting. Um, but it gives you an idea of some of the concerns that people have in mind. I mean, some of the precautions listed there may, may appear over the top. Uh, depending, I mean, if all you have is uh, is uh, the exercise yoga ball in in, in a closet, uh, you probably don't need to, to to go to that extent. But they were talking about touchless doors. They were talking about um, reworking some of the ventilation. They were talking. There was all sorts of um, precautions. So we'll put the link. You can have a look at that. What about the next one? What about um, back to my managers? What about interior party rooms and game rooms and uh, maybe with you, uh, Sean? Yeah, I mean, at this point, it's it's pretty easy. Our, we're taking a blanket approach to uh, not ready to open anything. Um, the reality is uh, nothing, it's not just a question of reopening. It's always going to be changing the, that behavior and how the spaces are used. Um, right. And at this point, we're not, we're not in a position that we can comply with uh, requirements on the, the physical distancing, the crowds, um, and the cleaning, to be honest. Uh, I mean, the... the We've across the portfolio, we've increased cleaning at all uh, all sites. Uh, just that was an immediate change uh, in March. Um, but the reality is that's got to continue. And if you're increasing the use in the public spaces, you're even increasing it more. Uh, and likely after every uh, every use, as as Catherine pointed out, you know one family, one one uh, residential unit at a time, and and a thorough cleaning afterwards. Um, so it comes down to a question of resources. 
for the Congo yeah. corporations. Right, absolutely. And again, we see the results of the survey. I'm not going to repeat them, but you see how is Condo Lions sort of reacting at this stage in time. And I see some comments in the chat room. Well, what about us? What about our library? What about our barbecue? And at the end of the day, this exercise is, a, is very much condo specific. It's going to vary on all sorts of factors, the, the demographics, the layout, the size, the density. It's going to, and so each of you have to do that exercise. Uh, and ask yourself these questions. And I think I'm gonna ask Jason to speak to that in a, in a couple of minutes. Now going to the next one. Um, what about the interior car wash, uh, Catherine? I, again, I think that might be an area that could be suitably or adequately physically distanced in order to be able to use it. Car washes publicly are something that are made available. The concern has to do with whether or not there's a need for sanitation of the equipment specifically. So uh, in some locations, it's as, uh, as small as literally a garden hose with a spigot on it. In other corporations, it's slightly more sophisticated than that. The concern has to do with whether or not it can be sanitized in between and whether or not specific precautions need to be implemented before somebody could make use of that. Finally, if you're not cleaning the underground garage or you're exacerbating that situation by having people wash their cars inside, those are all questions to be answered uh, by the board in considering whether or not that can be opened. Right, and we see that there's already more of an openness in condo land with respect to, to that. Back to you, Sean, indoor pools and spas, open or not? Uh, short answer, not. Um, again, the uh, I think we had a, a great uh, session on that last week, talking about uh, some of the, the differences between a pool and other facilities, other amenities. Um, but at the same time, at this point, uh, we're still at a no. Um, the you know public pools are not being opened, uh, and we're we're using that as the kind of the benchmark before we start uh, moving ahead. Right, and in fact, uh, I would say you have to approach this uh, in two steps. The first question will always be. Is it permissible in Ontario? Are we even allowed to do it? And right now, as Graham presented, the answer is no. The, these actually, Ontario is prohibiting the reopening of public pools, of public gyms, and so on and so forth. So that And that's, that that's indoor and outdoor. That's right. And so then whenever um, Dougie, uh, you know, blesses us with the opportunity to reopen some of these facilities, the second question comes up, which is, well, is it safe? Is it desirable for us to do it? Okay, uh, to you now, Catherine. Well, I guess we dealt with the pools already uh, and move on. I wanna see, I wanna ask that question in July when it's a uh, plus 42 billion degrees, see how people feel about their pools. Uh, back to you, Catherine. What about uh, opening sort of exterior parks and patios and gazebos and rooftop terraces? So it's a, it's a half and half from my perspective and, and understand as well that you've got some municipal uh, regulations as well that you have to abide by and I speak specifically about Toronto because Toronto has already uh, set out into the diaspora the fact that they are likely to be later to reopen than other locations in Ontario. So when it comes to things like exterior, you know, rooftop barbecue areas, rooftop picnic tables, gazebos, um, as Sean aptly put it when we were preparing for this, anything with a structure, uh, those aren't being opened. There are gathering locations, which again is a no-no. And second of all, we still have the same concerns with respect to sanitation. Um, everybody having been safe at home for so long, they're going to want to use things and very quickly, right? So you have to be able to affect appropriate sanitation. And it may be that these types of exterior children's play equipment, barbecues, um, picnic tables cannot be used again until in the greater uh, use of public space, we're comfortable in not having them cleaned or sanitized in between usages. Right, and we see that the uh, those responding to the survey, there's a more of an appetite uh, when it's outdoors uh, and for, for, for obvious reasons, I think. Uh, what about children's play structure? Yeah, you've covered that uh, right now, uh, Catherine. And uh, I mean, the vast majority of us out there don't have those. Uh, but um, the bigger concern, I'll be blunt, with the children's play structure is because they are not open publicly yeah. in the municipality, you're not just going to get children within your own community playing on them. You're going to have all of the friends of everybody close by using it as well. And not only is that a risk from a COVID-19 perspective, I have concern about the general liability issue. And, and I feel terribly that the kids can't just go out there and run about on the jungle gym, but that is what you'll also have to consider if you have one. Right. Yeah, okay. I was gonna jump in and just quickly say that uh, kids play structures that are meant to be used by people from more than one household, I believe, are still closed. Absolutely. Right. So, I mean, Ontario has spoken, folks. 
Uh, Sean, exterior sporting facilities. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, tennis courts, basketball courts. Um, I don't pickleball know. courts. That specifically was in the legislation that pickleball <laughs> courts are now open. Get out. The Ontario I, thing. Can you remind me what pickleball is? Because yeah. I might be short on athletic ability. So I'm I, I Googled it. I mean, I'm short on athletic abilities too. So I Googled it and it looks like one more thing I won't be very good at. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sean, what about what do you think? Open or uh, not? So, for the exterior sporting facilities, uh, basketball court um, where you bring your own ball, I don't have an issue with that. I, I think that fits within the, uh, the requirements as long as you're not playing contact. So, if someone's just shooting hoops on their own, that's, uh, that's pretty easy to do. The difficulty is always going to be, as Catherine said, you open something up and it becomes a magnet for people to, to get drawn in. And that's what we're trying, still trying to avoid. Um, so, you know, tennis courts, uh, they have good guidance on uh, opening tennis courts or using tennis courts, you know, singles only, you can't share balls, uh, you can't have locker facilities open unless they're attached to washrooms and it's only for those purposes. So, you know, following that guidance, it can certainly be uh, doable. Uh, but again, if you're the only tennis court open uh, in, in the neighborhood, you suddenly become a magnet for, for other non-residents. So good news, everybody. Herbie uh, answered the question on the chat line. A pickleball is apparently has to do with a, like a smaller tennis ball, I guess. It's like a tennis a game of some sorts. Um, we'll try to see maybe if we can show a video next week of uh, David and uh, Graham. Uh, Playing pickleball. At that. Yes. They're not from well, the same household. Is that a restriction or, or if they play it in Quebec, it's okay? Uh, oh, right. We'll have to go to Quebec for that. Uh, what about communal barbecues? Uh, Catherine? I am of the no opinion for the time being, and that's because we settled upon and needing to ensure that it was sanitized between usages. Um, I would love to, to say that it were possible, uh, you know, here's a baggie with wipes uh, and, and use it at your own, at your own peril. Uh, but I don't, I don't think that that is the case. I don't think that is the governance. We're fortunate for the time being in Ontario and in Toronto specifically that those types of areas are to be closed. Um, and that will be one of the first things that folks want to reopen. I, I feel confident that they are to be closed. Okay, yeah, for sure. At this point in time, they are to be closed. Um, now, that's it. We've gone around all of your facilities. I realize that all of you people in the greater Toronto, you have all sorts of other facilities. You have windmills and you have Disneyland and you have all sorts of other things and a wine cellar and a cigar smoking a lounge. But, it's a uh, virtual golf area, that's all. It doesn't, it don't make us sound ludicrous. Yeah. So oddly enough, by the way, one of the uh, ranges that was being opened is an interior and outdoor uh, shooting range. Uh, so if one of your condos in your portfolio, Catherine, has an indoor shooting range, don't get elected on that board. Okay, moving <laughs> I on. I do not. No, thank you. We will now talk uh, legal. I'm going to turn to uh, Denise mainly. Denise, um, uh, you and I have asked ourselves this question. Is ever going to happen that we're going to reach a point in time? Actually, not yet, Denise. I'm going to go to Jason. Um, but we've all asked ourselves that question. Is there ever going to happen? Are we ever going to have a webinar where we're going to say, hey, folks, open it all up. It is safe now, sunny ways ahead. And, and we sort of concluded that it's not going to be tomorrow or next week or maybe next month or maybe next year. Um, as I said, at the end of the day, what may be safe for my corporation may not be safe for your corporation. But rather than, and I'm turning to you, Jason, in a minute, rather than say no, 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 um, I think there's probably a way to tackle this, to have a longer vision, like a bit of a business plan. Um, when you have this discussion at the board level, like how would you tackle that, Jason? So, I mean, it's, I use a business case uh, sample almost. So a business case can be a one page to two page document where I can outline the pros, the cons, what others are doing in the industry, um, and then outline, okay, if we had to make these steps and take these considerations into reopening, what would it look like? Do I need an engineer? Do I just need to hire some laborers and pull out two or three machines? Do I need to map it out? What would cleaning look like? How often would I need to clean it? It's not just the cleaning requirements, but it's also the PPE or the personal protective equipment that's required for those 10 additional cleaning sessions. If you're burning through personal protective equipment 10, 20 times a day, uh, cleaning amenities, don't forget, you're burning through personal protective equipment 
to complete and run the business or the, the vital operations as well. So having a little bit of a business case. So I envision a one page document that says, if we had to open this and we had to open it with these guidelines, here's a cost per day or a cost per year. Here's an, a, an assortment of resources that would be required so that the C-suite or the decision makers can make that decision with an educated and informed kind of two page summary of what it would take to open. Right. And I know that we keep saying it's about the resources. Do you have the resources to clean that, that off? And do you have the resources to put in place this, that, and the other? And we're always going back to the cost. And, and that sort of makes sense, practical sense. But at one point in time, the question may be, is this now the new cost of doing business? I mean, we're incurring costs right now to have uh, uh, two months ago, three months ago, six months ago, when, when you had a gym, when you had somebody go in and, and tweak and, and, and maintain this equipment, there was a cost to that. There's a cost to everything that we're doing. And so it may be that at one point in time, uh, the question won't be, oh, is, is there additional cost? But the question may be, okay, so there is additional cost. And so what do we do? Are, are we I mean, at one point, that's maybe the cost, of, as I said, the cost of doing business. Yeah, how okay. do we move forward exactly? Right, right. Okay, legal enigma chapter now. Uh, this was fun actually yesterday when we were preparing this, uh, Denise. One of the questions that came up was, and it's like sort of twofold. One of the questions that came up is, okay, so if we're gonna have costs associated with getting our amenities ready, COVID ready, uh, if we're gonna have to put plexiglass, if we're gonna have to, um, I don't know, like, play with the uh, ventilation. Um, are these reserve fund expenses? What do you think, uh, Denise? Yeah, I think, uh, Rod, you and I came to an agreement after debating this topic for about 15 minutes yesterday. Um, <clears throat> so I think at this point, I mean, it may be that reserve fund studies will now take these kinds of expenses into account for future, but right now, most of reserve fund studies do not include this kind of item. Um, I know Catherine mentioned yesterday, there's usually a, a provision dealing with building code uh, changes and it may fall into that category, but this really isn't a building code issue. Um, so really you have to look at your study. I doubt that it would be a reserve funds expense right now. Right, and under the act, uh, the sections pertaining to what you can spend your reserve fund money on says, reserve fund shall be used solely for the purpose of major repair and replacement of common elements. And, and there may be sort of two schools of thought on that. Uh, maybe the more orthodox one is, well, if you're not uh, repairing or replacing something that already exists, uh, can that be paid out of the reserve fund? And maybe another sort of, um, uh, school of thought could be well. I mean, if you if it's capital in nature, if it's not operating, uh, could could we use that? The fact that we didn't have it before, but now we need it, uh, is that not does that not fall under the reserve fund? Well, I think but, number, uh, one, number one, you know, I I think I agree with your first point there, and not number two. I think once you do the alteration and put in these, you know, in your gyms, all these uh, side panels then it will become a reserve fund expense next time around when you update your study. So you've heard it here first, folks. Um, no, it doesn't fall in there. Uh, but there was a, there's a second question though, that was a, that's to me is as interesting. If we're going to make these changes, um, are these changes to common elements? And if they're changes to common elements, do you need to consult with uh, with the owners, do they need to vote? What's the threshold that's required? And let me start maybe, and uh, Denise, if I miss or misspeak, if I miss something or misspeak, uh, you can come and, um, and add to it. So if what you're doing is maintaining and repairing uh, what you already have, um, even with some changes to reflect the industry standards, well, that's not a change, that's maintenance and repairing. But if we're gonna go in and do more work, um, and it's not really maintenance or repair, if we're adding, well, then you, you go to the next level of questions. And the next level of question would be, well, okay, so uh, is it required for the security and safety of individuals using it? And that is one of the exceptions, allowing corporations to go ahead with a change. Um, but if it's required for the safety and security of persons, then 
technically you don't need to consult with the owners and they don't get to vote on it. I mean, you can't put to a referendum safety and security. That's, that's basically the lesson here. Having said that, when I say that technically you don't need to consult, I mean, politically uh, and neighborly, you do want to tell people how you spend their, their money. But if, if you can fall within that category of safety and security, you may not need technically it's not, a, it, it's not a change that requires a formal consultation. Now, if you don't fall within that category, and if, you, if you're making a change that is not required for safety and security reasons, then the question will be a question of cost. And if it's below 10% of your uh, annual budgeted common expense, then you just need to do it on notice. You advise the owners, we're gonna do this change, it's gonna cost this much, it's less than 10%. Um, you have 30 days if you wanna call a meeting. Uh, and if it's above 10%, you actually then have the onus, the corporation has the onus of calling the meeting uh, and, and you need to secure two thirds of the owners to, um, to, uh, to approve it. What we've done, and uh, let me bring you, cause just, I thought it would be fun. Let me uh, see if I, I'm now sort of flying on instruments here. Let me see if I can find this, if I'm able to do this quickly. We've put together on, do you see the uh, web page now, Grim? Yeah. Yep, we can see it. Okay, so we've put the, we have a little tool we put on our blog. If you if you look for the blog, uh, should the owners vote on a change to common elements, we've put mm -hmm. a um, a uh, a decision tree here that you can use. So, are you uh, making a change, or is this an addition? Perhaps. So, we're gonna put the we're gonna put plexiglass. So, it is a change. Okay, if I click on this, is it necessary for the security and, and safety of people? And I would think, I think Denise, your answer to that would be yes, it probably is for that. Yeah, right. I want to raise a point there. Um, sure. The board has to determine that. And in order for the board to determine that, I think they need to rely on professional opinion. Yes, no, I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree because, and, and it's going to depend what is the change. I mean, the security and safety of individual, it, there's a bit of a um, uh, subjective element to it. Um, uh, to some extent, right? But anyways, if you keep following the prompts, let's say you assume you concluded that it was not for the safety of security, you click on no, then the next question is, is this change to prevent imminent damage to the, to the common elements? No, okay. Is it required to comply with it? And so, I mean, you can just obviously just keep following this and then eventually it's gonna give you the answer of whether or not this is a change on notice or this is a change requiring a meeting or this is not a change. So anyways, if you want to have fun and, and, and putz around when you have nothing else to do uh, until you're allowed to go outside and have tea in public, you can uh, play with that. Let me see if I can go back to uh, the slideshow now and we'll continue. Uh, did I miss anything, uh, Denise, on this? Are we done with this? Uh, yeah, no, I think that's good. Okay. Uh, now on to in-suite renovations. And we've spoken about this in the past. Uh, yeah, and, um, but we got a lot of questions about this in part because Ontario has lifted the restrictions about uh, constru on construction. And, and you have owners that have been uh, chomping at the bit to try to get the, their in-suite renovations done. And so David, can you maybe mm -hmm. break down uh, what are the kinds of restrictions and conditions that uh, we recommend implementing when an owner wants to go ahead with that work? For sure. So what we've been doing is uh, a four stage approach. The first thing we do is we prepare a letter to the owner. You set out the context for them, remind them why the corporation is so concerned about in-suite renovations. They're concerned about health and safety. They're concerned about liability. They're concerned about all of these additional outsiders in the common elements and the elevators at the same time. Remind the owners the corporation has the legal authority to limit or stop in-suite renovations. Again, what we said last week, just because you can doesn't mean you must. Uh, and insist on some strict conditions. Uh, again, this is to limit traffic and maintain sanitation. And you see some of them listed there, things like only allowing one trade in a unit at a time, making sure there's no more than five contractors on site, uh, insisting on PPE, uh, use of the in-unit washrooms as opposed to any common washrooms on the floor, uh, restricted and coordinated use of the elevators, and limited working hours to ensure um, mostly for noise and nuisance and also to make sure, make sure that people aren't going up and down during elevators when they're during busy times. Um, the next stage of this is insisting the owner uh, signs a waiver and indemnity agreement. Now this is something you will get pushback on because no one likes to uh, waive 
uh, their rights or uh, cover liability for other people. But the point of this is always, from the corporation's perspective, to protect their uh, liability from claims. Because again, they don't have to allow this. They're allowing you to do in-suite renovations because you're asking for that privilege, and they are saying, yes, you can do it with these conditions. So a waiver and indemnity agreement protects the corporation against claims commenced by other owners, any claims commenced by contractors, or fines and fees that might be uh, issued against the, the contractors that in some way might then turn upon the uh, corporation. Uh, next, we suggest you that you inform other owners of the work being done and the restrictions. So this makes sure that all the other owners are aware of the steps that are being taken and that there won't be any questioning after the fact, oh, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you let us know about that? And that also means that letting the owner who uh, is requesting the repair work know that there might be a, a, a delay of a week or two in between when they're asking you to actually allow the work and, uh, and when it actually takes place to allow time for the other owners to be notified. And finally, we've been having um, all of the contractors who uh, enter the premises of the, of the corporation fill out a daily health screener. This is a questionnaire, uh, includes the typical questions from public health. Uh, do you currently have a fever? Uh, have you been around anyone who has been tested positive? Have you traveled uh, internationally within the past 14 days, which I don't think anyone has at this point. Um, and then having them also sign off on uh, whatever the COVID health protocol of the corporation is. So this is things like, um, it, again, the conditions that we talked about before, the restrictions, uh, and also uh, you know, giving management or whatever uh, representative of the corporation the opportunity to show the contractors, here's where the washrooms are, here's where the hand washing facilities are, um, and having those contractors sign off and agree each time they enter uh, the the, the premises. And all of this might sound like overkill, but this is how you paper a file. And this is how I think of it as, as a lawyer, as a litigator. When I see something happen, happened, I always want to see what did the corporation do to protect itself? What did the owner request? And, was, and who was being reasonable and who covered their bases? So this is all things to discuss with your professionals, but these, this is the steps we've been taking so far. Right. And one of the questions that came up on the chat uh, channel was, well, what about if an owner is doing the work themselves? And obviously some of these don't apply to the owners, but some do. Some of these concerns that David has identified do apply. Uh, one of them would be, for instance, uh, lugging up and down material and equipment and, and tools and so on and so forth. Uh, so that's unnecessary traffic, right? Um, I realize that it's traffic by an owner but all of these things go into the in, into the mix uh, and and again as David said and as Graham said um, the fact that the province is allowing you to do something doesn't take away from the corporation's duty and responsibilities and right to control and manage and uh, the common elements at the end of the day everybody is all about is, is all in favor of apple pie and freedom and this and that but it just takes one flare-up in one condo corpse and everybody's going to wonder like wh what possessed us to reopen uh, the barbecue for instance right um, next topic Denise, maybe you can and this is a question that we get over and over and over again what would go in a good electronic, I call it electronic bylaw. What, what should go in a bylaw that deals with uh, electronic meetings and electronic votings? Okay, um, before we get into the details, um, I, I've been getting, and you, you too, Rod, we've been getting a lot of inquiries about this bylaw. And what we are recommending, because after the emergency period has ended and you can no longer do a virtual meeting, Get the bylaw in place now. So anyone who is calling an AGM should be adding this to the agenda. Do this easy to pass bylaw. Um, so let's get into what is in this bylaw. I mean, you, Rod and I, um, and Josh worked on our form of bylaw and it took uh, quite a few back and forth to determine what should be in it. There's two components. One is the meeting itself. And if you look at the slide here, um, you want to make sure that all of these items are in the bylaw. I think you mentioned last week, Rod, you saw a bylaw that had a paragraph and somebody was calling that a virtual meeting and electronic voting bylaw. Right. Oh my, you know, if you don't have enough details in this bylaw, then really, um, you know, anyone could do anything. And, and it's really important. Uh, we have to preserve the integrity of the election and of meetings. We need to make sure that there's a process in place. 
So you need to know that you're registering only owners. If an owner's in arrears, they shouldn't be voting at the meeting. Um, how do you determine quorum? Because quorum is not just those in attendance, but those who have voted electronically and proxies. Your bylaws should deal with that. Uh, where are you now? I've changed slides. Um, are we done with this slide? Uh, Real-time participation. Um, that is where owners should all be able to view the show of hands and questions. Keep it open, not just exclusively the chair. That needs to be in the bylaw. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, now this deals with the vote. So there's two components I said. One is the meeting itself and the other is the electronic voting. And how should that work? Well, again, um, the way uh, Rod, you and I think it should work is that voting starts before the meeting. Your notice goes out and that's when the electronic vote starts. Similar to gathering proxies ahead of time, that's when your, your voting starts. So that's right in the bylaw. Uh, the voting period, when should that close? That should be in your bylaw. And that is usually after the nominations from the floor, whatever the end of the vote is, or as determined by the chair. Again, that should be in your bylaw. Uh, all owners are entitled to vote electronically, not just those that are logging into the meeting, but all owners. So even if you're not at the meeting, you could vote electronically at any time from the notice period all the way to the close of the meeting. And again, there has to be a system in place, and this is through the electronic voting process that you can validate and authenticate the owner, or if it's a proxy holder that's voting, that you can authenticate the proxy. Uh, and what's really important, and this is why you can't do a vote on Zoom without having separate electronic voting done, is it has to be by secret ballot. So you can't have people seeing who everybody votes for. It has to be confidential. And that you do through the electronic voting platform. I think that's it. I think that's it. I think that's it. And there's a few more slides, I think, um, uh, because uh, we sort of broken it down more, but those will be accessible on the um, on our website. People can just people are asking if they can have um, details. So we'll be able to share this. Yeah, we'll, okay. yeah, we will put it up on the condo advisor side. Again, when you look at past AGMs, you get to see the recording, you get to see whatever resources were shared. Sometimes we put link to articles or to websites, but we also certainly put the um, upload of the PowerPoint presentation. Um, sort of pushing people forward because I did not want to run out of time for our engineer uh, stumper segment, engineering stumper segment, because uh, last two weeks ago, I um, unceremoniously uh, cut off uh, our good friend, Justin, and um, I had to speak to his lawyers to get him back here. Uh, so Justin, uh, I think the topic to me that's the most interesting to me has to do with can reserve fund study inspection proceed now? Well, like the HVAC question, I wanna thank you for giving me a question that's gonna upset half the people uh, my answer will do. Um, Obviously, class threes, the reserve fund's not requiring a site inspection. They can go ahead. Just make sure you have your meeting remotely and you'll figure it out. Class ones on new buildings where largely we assume everything is acceptable and we're basing a lot off the drawings, you can do a lot of the work based off drawings and your reserve fund planner should be able to. The ones we're talking about now are the class twos, that the, the standard walk arounds, the six year checkups, or sometimes they're the only types of reserve funds that uh, everybody does because we think they can safely be done now and they can certainly be done more safely and more uh, with better social distancing than some maintenance projects. So it comes back to what the law says and the change this week allowed all construction sites to be essential and it's permitted all maintenance and repairs as required. Engineering itself is not considered essential yet as it was before April 4th. And although I consider the RFS an integral step into, into a maintenance plan and, and the inspection is required for there, I'm leaning towards the opinion that these RFS inspections are not yet permitted, but I'm really hoping one of the two lawyers here will tell me I'm wrong. Okay, so the conclusion is cautious on the engineering uh, side, which is we probably, when it comes to those visits, these on-site visits, it may or may not actually 
um, be permitted. Uh, Denise, a reaction to that? Well, uh, I, I think Rod, you and I agreed on this yesterday. I don't know if you changed your mind, um, but I think that if it can be performed safely, uh, the condominium act says you have to do these reserve fund studies every three years that you should proceed that it is in the nature of a repair you know it is for the purpose of planning your repairs and that is permitted right i tend to agree with you uh, in the sense that uh, i think the reserve fund study inspection is a very very preliminary step towards maintenance and repairs and it's certainly in my view form an integral part of the essential operations of the building so so i would tend to think that that coupled with the fact that all uh, construction restrictions have been lifted i would tend to think that it's probably uh, permitted having said that you need to be consistent with your owners and and you if on the one hand you tell your owners that they can't congregate by the garbage chute and they can't have tea on the rooftop terrace and at the same time you have justin and his army of engineers roaming around and measuring stuff and touching and poking um it's very difficult i think to justify uh, one set of restrictions if you're not sort of consistent uh, and certainly, if you are going to allow these kinds of visits, as Graham said at the beginning, you really have to keep um, all the other sort of measures that are expected and imposed by the province, social distancing, um, screening of contractors, um, and, 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 and uh, the washing of hands and the whole thing, right? And so I think, Justin, we would probably say that it's permitted and we're still stuck with the question, is now the time to do it though, but that's where we're at. Yeah, sorry, Drog, can I just jump in? I just want to mention if you're not going to do the reserve fund study and if it's required, you're in your three year period, you've got to put it on your status certificate. Right, oh, absolutely, very good point. And so is it different for performance audits, uh, Justin? It's a little different. Obviously, performance audits are required to be done within the first year after declaration. Um, it's, there's already a little bit of conflicting information. The currently carry on requires the performance audit to be submitted one year after declaration, but the act requires it to be submitted uh, at the end of the 11th month. So typically what we'll do is we'll send over a blank performance at the end of that 11th month as a placeholder if the report isn't finished. Under the times of COVID, carry on has suspended all deadlines while, Ontario, while the uh, state of emergency is declared, but the act hasn't changed. Um, so what does that mean? Uh, who knows? It's taken them 19 years not to define adequate. So uh, when they tell us that you'll get a reasonable extension thereafter, uh, I'm not exactly uh, sure what that'll mean when it washes out. But that being said, if you have a performance audit, still submit a blank one at the 11th month, uh, month period to be uh, in compliance with the act, but then listen to what Terry on says when they provide you a reasonable extension when all this is over. Okay, well, I have uh, good and bad news for you, Justin. Bad news is your next two topics have been cut because we're running out of time. Good news, you're hired for next week. Thanks so much. I need to keep moving because I don't want people to uh, be upset if I don't uh, allow Jason to uh, touch a bit upon his segment. And so, um, Jason, one of the questions that we keep hearing is uh, what about PPE, uh, personal protective equipment? How is it that we're imposing it on staff, uh, but we're not imposing it on residents? Is that like a two, two weights here or what? Oh, I think you're, you're muted. Let me just unmute you. Is that better? That's wonderful, thanks. Sorry, my apologies. Uh, listen, um, uh, I, I've got a 50-50 shot here. Some of the condominiums I'm speaking with are doing, uh, all staff are wearing masks and they're interchanging gloves between tasks and they're wearing masks throughout the building. And they've done that for two reasons. One of them is because social distancing cannot always be completed because residents don't always respect it and service providers don't always respect that. So it's something that they've done for their staff of employees, but they've also done it to provide motivation and empowerment to the community to say, we're doing this and we're taking this very seriously. And it's not done so much to protect the employees, but it's to, it's done for a perspective from the community that everybody's doing their share. Can you come out and ask your residents to wear them within the building? I'm not aware of any reason, but I am aware that the uh, Public Health Canada has now recommended everybody wearing masks. Right, 
Right. And, and, and again, I guess it goes from what we said from the very first webinar uh, in March, believe it or not, um, people have to stay in their lanes. And the fact that the province is recommending it to for all residents, uh, for all Ontarians to wear a mask, um, oddly enough, that wasn't the recommendation at first, but the fact that they're recommending it now, it doesn't really mean that we as a corporation have the ability to impose it on people. Uh, if things may change, who knows, but uh, that's sort of, um, that's sort of where I'm standing on at, at this point. So certainly you have obligations towards your staff and, to, and you should provide them with that equipment as you just said, Jason, but um, I'm not sure that I'd wanna be in the business of providing masks to my, to my owners and residents. Uh, Denise, any reactions to that or? Okay, there you are. Okay, agreed completely. Stay in your lane. You heard it here first. Okay, wonderful. Uh, that's it. Uh, Graham, do you want to launch the last poll about topics? Uh, we were debating whether or not we should venture into a, a non-COVID related topic. So I don't know if you can launch that. That's going to be and the last poll before we go. It should be up. Okay. And so the question to you is uh, our next episode, uh, do we uh, do, I guess there's a word missing here. Do you want us to do a non-COVID episode? So if, if yeah, you want to non-COVID episode, you click on yes. COVID episode, you get out of this room and no preference, fine, you can stay. No, it's really up, it doesn't matter to me. So, wow, it's uh, pretty divided. So w this brings us to the end of our um, uh, scheduled seminar. And I'm gonna do as I usually do, I'm gonna go around the table, see if anybody has anything to, to say before we let them go. And I'm gonna start with uh, you, uh, Sean Cornish from Apollo Property Management. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Anything to add? Uh, no, just reiterating, uh, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And, uh, you know, sometimes I feel like we're uh, a bunch of teenage kids standing on the cliff above a quarry full of water, seeing who's going to jump in first. And, you know, you don't need to be the first one to, to make the move. Let's, uh, there's no rush. Just take right. your time to do it properly. Absolutely. Uh, Catherine Gao uh, from Crossbridge speaking on behalf of ACMO. Anything to add? You're on a timer, Catherine. <laughs> It, the advice remains the same. Keep calm, wash your hands, sanitize your cell phone. Do start speaking publicly with your communities if you haven't already about the considerations that need to be in place before you can open up condo land. It will help buy you some time. Uh, even when the, the province allows it or your own municipality allows it, the condominium corporation might still have to do some heavy lifting in between. Right, absolutely. Thank you so very much, uh, Denise uh, from Lash Condo Law, obviously, and also speaking on behalf of the Community As Association Institute of Canada. Anything to add to this, uh, Denise? Well, just more in line with the whole meeting. Um, time to schedule your AGM, and you know you've got your 120-day period. We don't know when that's going to end, but now's the time to do it. Right, absolutely. That's important to keep this in mind that people still have that choice, either to postpone it for that period following the end of the emergency period, whenever that is, or to hold it virtually. And that's still an option. And, and I think, uh, anyways, we'll maybe next week we'll talk some more about that. Uh, Graham McPherson of Gowling WLG, do you want to share the results of the uh, poll? Yes, here they are. Can everybody see that? Yeah, so what does that mean exactly? What so it means 38% uh, of people want us to do a non-COVID episode, 26% of people don't, and 36% of people have no preference. So it's it's pretty even split uh, with the no preference people. Uh, um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what to make of that stat, but uh, maybe maybe the answer is we, we cover some non-COVID related topic. I don't know. Uh, you're the director. We'll do like every other good director, we'll do whatever we want. Okay, fantastic. So moving, I'm just teasing, that's not true. Okay, uh, um, David Plotkin from uh, Galling WLG, what's your advice this week? For sure, uh, a lot has changed, but condo corps are still condo corps and they're responsible for what they're responsible for. You can't just shift the burden onto your owners. There's, there's a lot of chat uh, going on, you know, just. Have, have owners sign waivers and let them use all the amenities at their own risk. And uh, that doesn't, it doesn't work. You, 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 I mean, the, the liability always remains on the condo corp uh, to ensure, ensure that they are maintaining the safety and security and maintaining the common elements. You can't shift the burden onto owners. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. 
Um, Jason Reed of the National Life Safety Group. Thanks again for, uh, for bringing your, uh, sharing your expertise with us. Any uh, words of wisdom before we part? Yeah, really briefly, uh, I think it's an opportunity to also, you know, be grounded and go back to basics. Um, some property managers haven't been to the building uh, for a couple of weeks. Um, staff and turnover can change and be high at this time. So I think it's a great opportunity to just do a quick health check and make sure your basics are covered and we're getting back to those basics. Okay, wonderful. Justin Tudor, I think your mom is actually watching the webinar because I hear a lot of people in the chat room asking for more Justin. That sounds right. That sounds right. The, uh, as the world is on fire and rain, I guess. Nice. That's it. Well done. Thank you again, uh, Justin. Uh, see you next week. So folks, that's it for us. Uh, next week, we'll uh, hold the webinar um, uh, on Wednesday, May 27th at 5 p.m. Uh, you will need to register again. You know the drill. Hopefully, the drill will work this time. You can access the webinar tab on the condoadvisor.ca by clicking webinar. There's going to be a registration form. Uh, you should fill that in. Uh, and press register. If for whatever reason, it does not bring you immediately to a screen saying, congratulations, you've registered. If it doesn't do that, that means that we're probably still struggling technically on our end. Um, but fear not because, um, this is a little secret, if you go at the bottom of uh, the Condo Advisor website, we're on the day of the webinar, we always put the login information. So at the very bottom, you'll see it says uh, webinar login. And so if for whatever reason, if all fails, uh, you know, if all fails, you just go at the bottom, you click login and you will get the information to, to log in. So there you know, now you know. Thank you so very much. That's it for us. Episode 10, uh, opening condo land comes to a close. It was great having you with us. Uh, we don't take your time for granted. I mean, there's all sorts of better things to do. Uh, and we really appreciate your input. We appreciate getting questions from you. We appreciate the chat uh, uh, that we see online. Uh, that's why we do it. We do it for, for exactly for that. So thank you very much. See you next week. Same channel, same people, maybe same topic, who knows. Thank you so much. Take care, everybody.